On the 25th of July, the removal men arrived. Paul and Catherine spent the day with Darren and Kirsty. Once the van was on its way, Jan and I went for a quiet meal at a local restaurant. But no sooner had the meal arrived on our table than we noticed that the four children were peering in through the window. That evening, Graham and Muriel Gregory called round to say goodbye. At 8.30pm the next day we arrived at 39 Penrine Crescent Chilwell, Nottingham. Our new neighbours, Mabel and Harold, lent us a kettle and gave us a cake. And the Becks had left milk, cheese and bread, which were very welcome. The removal men arrived on the third day, and we shared macaroni cheese with the men at lunchtime. Paul and Catherine were soon making friends. However, one boy showed Paul how to break into our house. We called on Rob and Rue Drew, our contact students, who had invited us some weeks before. Mary and Leslie sent us a bouquet of flowers. Firstly, there was the sorting, decorating and shelf putting up. We then took Paul and Catherine into Nottingham by train to look around and to let them choose a moving present. Paul had a sweatshirt and Catherine a space hopper. Paul bought a MIDI system with the paper round money that he had earned in the Isle of Man. After going to Wentworth for cousin Laura's baptism, they prepared for their new school at Bramcote Hills. Before the term started at St John's, I made contact with my placement vicar, John Warman of Sawley, and was soon involved in funeral study groups, PCCs, prayer meetings, beetle drives, Sunday school, confirmation classes, men's groups, as well as church services. I took a salty and an ordinary cake to the Sawley youth group to demonstrate God looking on the inside when choosing David and had a bucket ready for the young person who ate into the salty cake. The farm next door to Sawley Church supplied us with our next cat who we named Mittens. Mabel and Harold took a shine to Mittens so we didn't see a lot of him and Jam was not very amused. Jan began supply teaching, teaching guitar, helping on the college tradecraft stall and studying for a certificate in theology. We went for walks and bicycle rides in the Peak District, especially along the old railway track between Ashbourne and Tissington. We discovered that the local graveyard which adjoined our back garden was a great place for walking Inca. College began with a barn dance and buffet and continued with a pattern of lectures, meals, tutorials and Thursday evening communion services to which a variety of speakers were invited. Among the lecturers, the college principal, John Goldingay, brought the Old Testament to life and George Babawi, an Egyptian Coptic Christian, helped me to see and understand the Holy Trinity. My tutor, Gordon Oliver, was particularly encouraging and helpful. Francis Bridger was constructive in his criticism of my sermons, and Jane Sinclair helped my confidence by asking me to preach at a college service. St John's College is an open evangelical college where we were encouraged to listen, to consider 
and to debate a wide range of issues, including all sides of the argument. Some students found this very difficult. Everything from abortion to euthanasia to the ordination of women and homosexuality. On the day we discussed the latter, a group of students from Northern Ireland just refused to debate this and just sat there chanting abomination, Dalek-like, over and over again. Paul took part in the school musical Bugsy Malone as Flash Frankie, the customer in the barber's chair who gets shot with a splurge gun. He obtained an outdoor catering job which took him to Woolerton Park, Castle Donington and Derby Airport. Some of the fellow students at St John's College Steve Hewitt, who also took a curacy in the Norwich Diocese. Simon Tyndall, whose ancestor translated the Bible. Dave Pearson, who moved to India, only returning here to stay with us and other friends whenever his visa ran out. Rod Faraday, whose conversion experience followed an encounter with the School of Wales while fishing at sea. Roly Ream, whose wife Rosalie tragically died in a car crash while moving their possessions to their first curacy. Mick Evans, the chain-smoking ex-coal miner. Andy Flowerday, whose brother-in-law Peter Knight was appointed incumbent of the Thurton benefice following Gordon Jessup. I began to attend a growth group and started in therapy with Rosemary Hutchby. I had found the pastoral care course very helpful, particularly the area of transactional analysis. Two dreams that I had at this time. A man and a woman sitting on opposite sides of a circular pergola. It is evening and they are both sad looking in opposite directions. They long to be together, but don't know how. One is my feminine side, and the other my masculine side. Then suddenly they stand up and walk towards each other, embrace and sit down, holding hands and looking at each other. There is an immense feeling of relief in them and in me. I was watching television with my dad, but I was disturbed by a box in a cupboard. I asked my dad if we could stop watching television while we looked in the box. He reluctantly agreed. I was quite afraid, and the fear increased when I partially opened it and saw a head. Was someone in there? I awoke from the dream in fear, my heart racing. And even though awake, I still felt fear. In the end, I decided that I had to confront the source of my fear. So I drifted into a half-sleep and found myself back in the dream room. This time I opened the box fully and despite a very high level of anxiety, climbed in and joined whatever was in there. I became one with it and the fear immediately left me. Catherine took up roller skating, bowling and guitar playing, joined the guides and also the Pathfinder group at Christchurch. Peter, a kitten from the Hewitt household, joined us. At first he hissed at Inca and Mittens, but was soon in league with Mittens, catching frogs. I visited Mum and Dad at Wentworth for a week. 
painting the inside of their wagon walk house, planting Leylandi trees outside, and preaching at a Wentworth Church Evensong. After Jan had completed her placement at the Queen's Medical Centre, we visited Barrow in Furness to be godparents to Chantel Bowker, and then we attended Margaret and Norman's wedding at Basingstoke. Kirsty joined us for a canal holiday between Atherstone and Kidsgrove. At Tamworth, a man on another boat told us off for mooring too near to the lock. The children started singing, We shall not be moved, and he added, And you've got some cheeky kids. There was a delay when the boat broke down but we eventually were able to get through Hare Castle Tunnel and back. Stopping for the night, we noticed some very bright lights and discovered the Wedgwood factory. On the way home, we stopped at Burley Road, Hinkley, where we met our former next-door neighbour, Sue. On our return, Stephen Hewitt and I spent two weeks on a placement at a hospice. I nursed a number of people there, heard their stories, sitting with them as they died and then helping to lay them out. All of this was carried out with the utmost care, respect and dignity, talking to the deceased as if still alive. We were also invited to take part in meetings with doctors, social workers and physiotherapists. I noticed a tension between the auxiliary nurses who felt that the doctors and registered nurses were too ready to subject terminally ill patients to chemotherapy, thus sacrificing patient comfort in order to advance the knowledge of pain control for the benefit of future sufferers. Secondly, between the nun who came in each day having prayed for two hours, who was then just with the patients, and the visitor from the Plymouth Brethren who basically just gave out Bibles to each patient and left. Jan and I attended the pre-ordination course which involved, among other things, a visit to the Co-op funeral parlour, where we saw bodies before and after preparation. Having applied for a post as curate in the Norwich Diocese, Jan and I set off for Rockland at 6am and saw the sunrise on the way. We shared a meal with the clergy and readers after I had been interviewed by the incumbent, John Lebwood. One retired clergyman named Alan Nietzsche gave the impression that he did not want me to go there. The others were fine. The following day, John rang to ask us to take up the post. Jan and I walked and talked in Attleborough, and by the end of the walk knew that it was right to go. Terry Clutterham visited us to look at the possibility of Jan and I leading a one-to-one -one holiday in Berwick-on-Tweed. We considered it, but realised that we wouldn't have enough time with our move to Norfolk. At the start of the second year I was appointed to be the link for a new student from Uganda named Humphrey. I collected him from the bus station in Nottingham and after tea, as he was without certain supplies and feeling the cold, we provided him with pullover, soap, toothpaste, food and a towel. 
During the autumn term, I joined a night school in wood carving, which I found quite therapeutic. Jane Sinclair asked me to preach in the college chapel on Jeremiah 3, 6-18, and Dot Cotton from East Enders came to my mind, providing me with an introduction. What a vivid picture of scandal and intrigue that Jeremiah paints in today's reading. Plenty of material for someone like Dot Cotton to spread around Walford. Do you remember that Ivy Israel, how she used to go off into the hills on the quiet with Billy Baal and Eddie Egypt? Well, now her sister, Julie Judah, is at it. You'd think she'd have learned the lesson seeing what happened to Ivy. But the incredible thing is that her husband wants her back. Over the two years in Nottingham, I found a good antidote to the intensity of college life in a regular run around a four-mile circuit at Attenborough Nature Reserve. This took about 30 minutes and I often completed two laps and occasionally three. Inca normally came along with me and we made great running partners. However, one day on the second lap I noticed that she was no longer at my side and at the end of the run I found her waiting by the car. We noticed that Inca was getting tired easily and an x-ray revealed a growth on her lungs or heart. We took her for a walk in Clumber Park before her operation when the vet discovered that the cancel was inoperable. Catherine and her friend Louise went to a New Kids on the Block concert in Birmingham. When Louise's parents brought them back from the NEC at 11.30pm Catherine was hoarse from screaming and said it was the best night of her life. On the way to a walk in Attleborough Park, I posted four important letters containing photographs for the Norwich Diocesan News and my baptism, birth and confirmation certificates. As we made our way back home, I noticed a blue light flashing ahead and there stood a fire engine from which a hose was spraying water into the letterbox. The next day I went to the post office to be shown a tray of ashes which was all that remained. Apparently this often happened on the last day of school. Jan sorted out the tenancy agreement with the Collinsons using OYE stationery after she discovered what solicitors charge. We took Paul and Catherine on a surprise trip to Alton Towers and Roger sold me his computer for £400. On the day of our move, the removal firm's van broke down. Fortunately, they subcontracted to another firm that got us safely to Surlingham. While the removal men slept at Lowen Lodge, we slept at Rockland Rectory. The next day it was all go, unpacking, establishing the study, receiving visitors, cakes and cards. I wrote an ode to St John's. Thrown together two years ago, wanted so much to fit in well. But you were interested by their show. The competitive climate was hell. I knew it would not be easy, but you told us busy was good. Felt unloved, unwanted and queasy, so didn't bother to do what I should. It's been an uncomfortable encounter. And now it's time for me to go. 
but was it a useful experience? To that I cannot say no.